Okay, a very good morning to all of you on this very bright sunny morning. Uh, so today we are coming up with the another episode of this uh, data science leadership series. And today uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Sian Sain. So Mr. Sian, he is the, as you can see, the head data labs with HDFC Life. And he hails from the ISI background. And also he mentors the our participants as well on various projects as well. So, uh, and there are participants who are watching us live as well. So, a very warm welcome to all of you. So, without any further ado, maybe please invite Mr. Sian Singh. So, over to you, sir. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause? <laughs> for the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, the set of contraptions wearing is not complete Perfect. yet. Bear with me. So normally I like to ask this question, right? Why data science? Right. So I started my career in what we call data science today, uh, many years ago, as can be seen from my green hair. And uh, I remember, like, it was difficult for me to for me to this this works. Okay. Anyway. So, before I start the slide, it was difficult for me to to tell people around in my neighborhood what I do for it. Okay. So, that's the Lakshman Rekha. Okay, that's the Lakshman Rekha. I have to be thinking within the box. Okay. So, I used to tell, uh, find it difficult to tell people what I do for a living because I was not an IT guy in the conventional sense and IT had already become a boom that time uh, and and it was really re very little known a subject so from there it really feels wonderful when I open the morning times of India and then I find a full page something on AI analytics or something like this right it was unthinkable that time so I believe a lot of a lot of awareness has come about the discipline. And along with a lot of uh, hype has come, I must say. A uh, lot of investment dollars have come into this discipline, right? So different people are attracted to this concept for different purposes, right? Uh, where I play a role is in the problem solving, uh, being a part of the industry, understanding an industry problem, and structuring it into a quant problem in the first place, and then providing a solution to the quant problem, evangelizing the insights to the, to the broader community within my organization, and working with other stakeholders to drive the implementation and, and um, gain value for the business and the shareholders. So that's what I do, and that's what most of the data science community in the corporate world we are engaged into, okay? So when I was asked about doing an industry session, I thought it would be a good pertinent uh, discussion area, a, a small one, but it's a very relevant one, how to drive the, the data science adoption, okay? Uh, there are all sorts of organizations who are using data science, on one hand, you have the very large uh, multinational corporations. On the other hand, you have got very successful unicorns. And then there are uh, much smaller organizations who are trying to, to re-engineer the process and, and adopt the benefits of data science. The fourth category is, of course, the startups who want to do something with data and create a business proposition out of it. Okay. So, Maybe how to use this data science as you're learning the different techniques in this program. Uh, maybe a little bit of discussion around that will be helping you to stay connected with the bigger picture, basically. Okay. So I have got a few slides, but I'll just use these slides as a conversion starter. By no way, this is a classroom, so um, an industry session. So this will be just a conversion a conversation starter, and. Uh, Feel free to ask questions, and I will share my experience and 
insights and uh, whatever I can, okay? So I've been working in data science, as I said, uh, almost entire my life. For uh, 15 years, I was in banking, banking, credit cards, payment industry, lending, this side. And for the last nearly five years, I am in a slightly different side of the BFSI in life insurance. So that gives a good perspective on the holistic uh, BFSI. So you can put it that way. So I've just made this presentation calling Making the Elephant Dance. That's a very famous uh, uh, catchy English phrase. So what I want to say is how do we transform the legacy businesses, the traditional businesses models. Uh, they may be doing very well for many, many years and they may be used to the way of doing things, but but is there a need for us to relook at the way the business is being done and 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 what are those we can help the organization with? And this is the this is the summarization of many conversations I have with many industry leaders who are in data science as well as outside of data science. So how do we disrupt from within? Uh, first of all, look at the, the, this is an interesting slide. I, I, I found it in Google. So increasingly the average lifespan of a company we find is shrinking. Have you guys seen this slide? Some of you might have seen this kind of slide. It's a very popularly available slide on Google, right? So if you see in the 1960s, uh, a typical firm's lifetime in years, and I believe they took only the listed firms or I don't know. In years, it's, it's more than 60. And of course, there are some unrelated patterns, but, but generally it's coming down. So we are here around 2020, sorry. So in 2020, it is somewhere less than 20. So it has shrunk by more than 70%, I would say, okay? So what is happening? Because new competitors are coming with an innovative business model, right? And this innovative business model may be driven by many things, among which two very important components are in their ability to use technology and data. So if you see the profile of the largest companies, I got this from the internet in the US, uh, just 10 years ago, look at in 2008, who were the uh, companies and where, when were they founded? You had Exxon at the top, founded 1870, uh, General Electric, 1892, Microsoft was a later addition. AT&T, 1885, Procter Gamble, 1837. You have Chevron and Johnson and Johnson, 18, still in the 19th century. Berkshire, somewhere in the middle of 20th century. Procter Gamble, I told Walmart. It's just that is history. Look at the look at the founding year and look at the industry they come from. Uh, one is a few are in the technology industry, Microsoft and. Uh, Google had appeared by 2008, but you have the oil companies, the Chevron, the Exxon, you have uh, Walmart, right? The, you have a manufacturing, large manufacturing giant, General Electric, GE, right? So that's the type of industries they came from. It is not that these companies have become irrelevant or rather these industries have become irrelevant. But if you look at the largest companies in the US in 2018, new names are coming, Apple. Of course, Google had just made an appearance here in 1998. You have Microsoft only remaining. Then you've got Amazon, Facebook, Baksha and Johnson Johnson still continuing, Exxon is still there. But there is a difference, and, and you can extend this list with respect to China. Uh, in India, we haven't caught up to that stage, but if you look at a company like, say, say Reliance, and you think as, as hypothetically two businesses, the, the data business, which is geo and all those things versus the old petrochemical business. New names are popping up, which are becoming big and have a big potential. So innovation is disrupting and among other things, this innovation is being 
sparked by increasing use and availability and use of uh, technology as well as data, right? You have firms like Oyo Room, like Ola, right? Who would have known that you can run a taxi service without owning a single cab? So Ola is a and Technologies, right? And same way, Oyo Room, they don't have physical assets. So this is an interesting pattern what we see. And if we, before going a little bit deeper into it, uh, if we see what are some of the emerging consumer trends, uh, it is with respect to demographics, the millennials, the centennials are appearing on the horizon. They are defining the consumption basket more than the pre-millennials. Uh, greater lifestyle awareness, be it money, be it travel, health, be it how you spend your leisure, right? People are changing their views. Our parents, when they went, used to go for vacations, one information was very little information was available, but I used to see my father carrying traveler's checks, and on a weekday, he had to go to the branch, and same with all our parents and grandparents. Traveler's check, you go on a weekend, and you encash the traveler's check, and then you, so today we have the payment uh, plastic cards, and even that is getting replaced by Paytms, right? So how we travel, booking a ticket. I mean, I can literally plan a trip to Rajasthan or say Kerala or Europe or Thailand. Just standing here, I can plan it in my mobile phone, right? So the way we are consuming is all changing. The third thing naturally, in the this goes on the, on the demand side. On the supply side, the competition therefore is coming up because there is money, there is, there is a possibility of creating value for the business. And that is creating this hyper-personalization. Hyper-personalization with respect to what we, what the firm offers, at what price point it offers, how it interacts and engages with the customers. In every dimension, there is a hyper-personalization, okay? And if you see some of the older models are also reinventing Kirana stores. Although it was not unknown, but I don't think the neighborhood Kirana shops had as much as home delivery facility for as little as if you buy things worth 100 rupees. Before this Amazon and, and the plethora of e-commerce flip cards and others that came along with and they're doing it. Even someone like Dmart, they are, they are trying to uh, transform the business model by opening some pickup stores at every neighborhood, right? So <coughs> competition is driving the hyper presentation. And then finally, the nature of our marketplace is digital connectedness. So the industry where I come from, life insurance, what was the existing model? Life insurance agents, they would be mingling with a group of say elderly people, maybe in someone's drawing room or maybe in a public park and then socialize with them and get to understand their needs and then very discreetly position their products, okay? <coughs> Today those public parks are no longer there, they are, they are fast vanishing. People don't have time for drawing rooms, conversations. So where do you find those people? Here, they're all present here. That's where we connect, that's where we engage. How many of you are not on WhatsApp? How many of you are not on any LinkedIn, Facebook, something like that, Twitter, Instagram? So that's where people are now present. <laughs> so the digital connectedness, okay? <clears throat> so in this emerging consumer trends, let's see how the new class of <coughs> firms, the business houses, they are trying to reshape the business world paradigm. So. I sometimes do a little bit this kind of research. There's a lot of material in the internet and it's a good exercise sometimes beyond the data and the formula and the mathematics. So if you see, uh, I have classified on the right side the incumbents, the traditional companies, right? And these are the large, very large corporations and large businesses or maybe 
medium size, but they're very well entrenched brands. So that's what I in include here. And then the digital first on this left side. So the first is the objective. Any incumbent, be it an FMCG, be it a textile, be it pharmaceutical, be it any, any incumbent, auto or auto parts, their main goal is to maintain the market leadership, right? Whether I'm number one, number two, number three. What is the objective of this digital? I don't care about that market definition. I will disrupt it and create my own market. So if you had Avis and Hertz, you've heard of the name of Avis and Hertz, right? So it's to provide cars on rent and then these cars on rent. So they had a different way of marketing. Who is number one, Avis or Hertz or cars on rent? And then Uber comes and says that, I'll disrupt it. I'll redefine the market. And if you see always the winners, more than crowding in the same marketplace, they have tried to redefine the market. This is not a new phenomenon. Dhirubhai Ammani did it many years ago. This is not a new phenomenon. Always they have been doing this. So no different with the digitals, the disrupt. How do they discover what to offer? What is the pr product and services? Incumbents start with first, my customers, who is my customer? Where do I position my brand? The segmentation is the primary important. And once I define the segmentation, mass market, affluent, high net worth, whatever I define the mass market, then I try to define the products, I try to arrange the service channels. Think of a bank, right? What is the approach of these digital companies? Digital data, whatever we look at it. This is very interesting. They first try to understand what is the customer pain point. Calling a taxi, you have to get out of your home, walk, take a chance on who is that kind soul who will stop by, right? So they are not setting the shop and then creating services. They're understanding the customer pain points first. And, and how do they understand? Through data analysis. If you have a business to consumer facing company, the consumer facing company, they always, they usually have a customer facing desk, either a branch or a call center or something. So they will start recording the customer interactions. Why are customers coming to me? What type of customers are coming to me? What is the purpose of their coming to me? How long does it take me to solve and address their issues? So that's how they're starting. And they're saying, okay, I will be in that business, that channel, that segment where I'm solving a real purpose. And this is a very important thing. Why? One way is you take technology and data to enhance your business model. The other way is, so here you're trying to take a sophisticated tool and trying to fit it, how it can help your existing process, proposition, pricing, whatever be it. In the other side, on the other side, you're defining those pricing, proposition and everything with the data that you have, okay. Of course, to analyze the data, you need to be armed with a lot of technology, knowledge, a lot of data analysis knowledge, which you're learning here, which you've learned before sometimes, and maybe in engineering classes, right? But that's the difference. Core assets. The incumbents, they lock in huge capital here. They invest in physical assets, a distribution network, a soft drink giant, right? They have huge bottling plants. What are core assets of digital first companies? Data and technology. Data and technology. You see how the, the, the difference is coming in what they value as the core asset. 
Uh, cost is a tricky one because these are already there. The relative cost in acquisition is less. I'm not saying the cost of acquisition is less for incumbents than for digital. But if I see the cost structure of a firm, possibly the cost of servicing is higher. But if I see a digital first company, the cost of acquisitions, right? Because they have to bombard with social media campaigns, Google, uh, Facebook, and many other ways so they, they, to get the customers. Uh, operating DNA, for them naturally it's capacity utilization, for them it's innovate, capital, locked in upfront commitment, and they're nimble footed and lightweight. So that's some of the ways. Now, why understanding this is important? Because when you are on ground, you have to quickly assess what type of context, what type of organization you are into. The moment you understand the strategic platform, it becomes easy for you to understand what is the type of business problems which you should be focusing on that will be more relevant for the business. Otherwise, I've just joined some place, I have some data, let me analyze. Let me, let me apply a convolutional neural network. How is that helpful to the firm? So your thinking should start from that way. That's, that's one of the suggestions. How the incumbents can win this disruption, okay? So one is because the digital companies, the new age innovation companies, they are defined by data, they are governed by data. The first thing that these companies can do is get more data. As simple as that, collect more data. Record every touch point of the customers who are coming. Now because you are learning the technology, you know on what platform it will be best stored because you are learning the data analysis techniques, you'd know like what is the most relevant analysis to address and process that particular type of data. It may be customer's survey feedback, it may be customer's product usage, it may be customer's call center queries, it can be anything submitted by the customer if they have to submit something called an application form, if you take up a credit card or life insurance, you have to submit an application form. If you buy biscuits, possibly that's not the data, then possibly the data will come through the distributors, the end shops, their ex experience with the customers, okay? Then holistic data integration. Once you have data, most organizations have data. It's not, ju not just in a one place. It's not clean, it's not usable sometimes not accessible. So eliminating these silos is one very big part of a data scientist's job. Why data scientist's job? Because only the data scientist, when I'm saying data scientist, I mean data science, data engineer, all this class of uh, roles within the organization. It is these people who understand the value of the data. So aggregate all the information and have uh, there are fancy names like data lake, well data lake or sea or well or whatever bit, but assimilate the data in one place that you can easily use it and for example, will merging the data from the HR source, HR system with the sales productivity give you additional insights? Will merging data from the credit database with the finance database give you additional insights than what you would have gone if you're just going with a siloed credit data mart, for example, okay? And you develop a 360 view of the customer. On that, you do the analysis. Now, this is what we usually understand as analysis. To most of us, our life starts, we assume the first two are already satisfied and we join this place to start from box number three. And this is one of the areas where a lot of budding young data scientists who take up this data science profession, they get frustrated because the first two boxes are not, are not there. 
and the person doesn't know that the first two boxes have to be there. So everything is on classification. If there is one single category of algorithms we can think of, most students, most of us, we focus on classification as the as everything of the data science. Very few of us actually can relate to a time series, which is also a very important forecasting um, utility because for a firm, they have to forecast the sales, they have to forecast the expense, right? How it goes over the next one year, two years, something like that. Optimizations, I don't even think people think it to be part of data science. But for a business, the Single most important is not classify. Single most important thing is, if I have got some fund to run my business, where do I allocate how much? What, how do I optimize my objective function, which is maybe maximize profit or minimize loss or whatever be it? So when we think of uh, machine learning, Common questions will be, okay, I know neural network, I know clustering, I know support vector machine, I know random forest. Very good, these are very important part and very dear to me also. But these are essentially doing various types of classification. Then you become, if you don't understand the data collection, the data aggregation, the other types of techniques, you become a one trick pony. And you will find that there's very limited value one can add to the organization. If you become a one trick pony. So keep this in mind, I mean, broad based the learning, that's what we try to do. And that is the purpose of being in the industry that we are expe exposed to different type of real life situations. So think of a doctor. If a doctor just knows how to treat two or three different type of disease, a general practitioner, do you find that GP very useful? No. Because then you're telling, okay, only if you have fever or a stomach upset or, or maybe a headache, you walk into this GP. Don't ask him questions about any other thing. So let this be not lost on us as, as learners of data science, the interspectrum. The, the fourth part is more on the technology side of it, the hyperscale decision making. What happens when you call an Uber or Ola? In a real time, it scours the entire lat long around that request location and returns that result. So of course, new and new technologies are coming every day. I think the most recent ones are coming are fast and go, go is the Google uh, developed uh, programming language. So these are coming very popular, react.js. I don't know, but that's what I hear. Uh, then using all these things is a transformational personalization. That's where the incumbents can. So if a new company, an, a digital first is developing one prototype of delivery, which is convenient to the customers. The incumbents, through continuous learning, they can also keep on uh, not only be remain in the game, but also dominate the game. They already have the brand. They're a market presence, familiarity. They have quality control process. They have regulatory checks and balances, okay? But as data scientists, this is how we see our role in, in helping the income, income, incumbents. The problem is, you pick up class at random, and the one word among everything written here is classification that is in the mind, which qualifies in the common brand we call as data science. Think of this holistic thing. And that is very important for the, uh, for the data science students when we join the job sector to understand. Uh, what are some of the roadblocks? They're very important. Now, if data science in a firm 
was driven by Alan Turing, or maybe the people in the firm knew who Alan Turing was, maybe things got a lot more easier in, in terms of accepting the viewpoints, but it's rarely and never that way, right? So there are some roadblocks. Uh, first is the sponsorship. Some of it is in your control as budding data scientists. Some of not, but at least knowing this helps you understand like how serious is this when you when you sit for the interviews and maybe you can try to discover during the pre-placement talks. One-on-one uh, interviews, not many interviewers will entertain this kind of questions, right? Who initiates this project? And a question like, okay, the ball, the buck stops with you. That's a philosophical high-level management question. Yeah, I know if it stops with me, I will stop the world for one day. Okay. And so who sponsors the vision? Are we here for making piecemeal transformations? Or are we here for radical change? And both have their own merits. It is not a right view to think always radical change is the best way. Oftentimes, incremental changes are better. I give an example, Airbus 380. It involves a lot, lot of planning, a lot of cost to build that huge aircraft. But what is the demand in the aviation consumers? Is it like point-to-point -point transportation? Then you need smaller aircraft connecting multiple points, right? Or is it like a low-cost, quick transit? Then maybe the large air passenger liners. Something flies between Hong Kong and Dubai from Dubai on to New York or London, right? But if passengers want a point-to-point -point connectivity, then maybe the market of an A380 kind of aircraft will be restricted. So it's very contextual. Therefore, what is the objective? Where do we prioritize? The strategy, again, the vision and the strategy. What is the difference between vision and strategy? Who can take this question? It sounds like a management class, although we are a data science, but understanding these things help us stay connected with the bigger picture wherever we are developing the data science solutions. Yes, please. Exactly. It's a good question. The simplest difference is what and how. What do we do? Where do we go? The vision part of it, strategy, how do we achieve that, okay? Talent, talent is problem solving, technical skills, communication. Problem solving, of course, because we exist in the industry to, to discover solutions to business problems that can be answered with respect to data and technology, okay? The no less important skills along with the, so problem solving means a mindset to be curious about taking on an unknown problem. You define the same logistic regression day by day. So your job becomes what I call is uh, analytics operations. The same technique the firm uses every day. Okay, and if the problem is changed one day, <coughs> We don't know how to solve it. Syllabus pe nahi tha. That's the mindset. Okay. The technical skills, of course, is required. The more the <coughs> larger the category and breadth of technical skills, the smarter you'll be. Okay. And everyone I've seen, <laughs> not everyone is a strong word. Most people, we first think of classification. The problem may be of optimization. The problem may be of analysis of variance. Because our understanding or the focus during the learning days on statistical measures is so limited. Grab an API and fit it and voila, it runs. Now the market conditions change, your customer's preference change, and we don't have any answer why they changed. So that's a risk we run. <coughs> Communication, very important. 
a brilliant mathematician, what is he doing in a corporate firm? He should be there inside a university doing his PhD and research. In a corporation, we have to mix with people from all background. We have people coming from accountancy background, finance, operations, field, or a different type of backgrounds, HR, personal management, right? And all of them are intelligent, or usually intelligent, but all of them definitely have their experience and their views. And the views have formed for a reason. So how do I put my viewpoint across, right? How do I influence? And likewise, not only influence, how do I learn also from them? Okay, my recommended approach doesn't work because this man is running this particular process of operations for so many years that he knows a lot more than they can say. So then what I do, I imbibe that insight into my algorithm designing, okay? So the communication skill is very important. Data, I said, availability, usability, and credibility. So the wish may be to become a Google or Uber, but data I have is only 100 rows in an Excel, right? Now if you have 100 rupees, you exactly don't go inside a Mercedes-Benz showroom. You walk to Kanjurmag railway station, right? So that reality feasibility study, right? And not just whether data is not there, how can data be augmented, which was my first box in the previous slide. Data using orthogonal data. I can take data from trade bureau, I can partner with other firms in the ecosystem, maybe my, my suppliers, maybe my distributors and get data. Okay. Uh, technology. This is very interesting. Without technology, nothing moves. The data science is like, like the double wallet doesn't move without the Mumbai local train. We don't move if the technology doesn't move. So one challenge is the legacy technology is like a black box monolith. Or even if it's not a black box, it's definitely a monolith. To make one change in that is either out of question or, or, or very, very tough, right? So how do we get the technology which is very agile. So think of like, so therefore if you see today, the technology that is being transformed into a host of microservices. Think of the different compartments of a train. When one compartment has got some challenge, maybe needs some maintenance, you have to shift that compartment, put something else in that. But the train still runs on time, goes to the destination, does everything it is supposed to do. So instead of a monolith, if you break down that into microservices by means of APIs, that is one way without disturbing the whole architecture, I can just modify that particular part. So, so the use of microservices is becoming very important, right? And one of the means why this is becoming easier for us to achieve is the cloud technology, whether AWS, Google Cloud, Azure, or any other cloud you may have, okay? Process, balance of experiential intuition. intuition. So my being a part of a corporation means I am a part of that business. So a data scientist, whichever industry you work with, tire manufacturing, industrial uh, firms, fertilizer, bank, insurance company, e-commerce, telecom, retail, media, whichever industry you're working with, try to understand that domain. Because the moment you understand that domain, you can think of many more ways where you can identify the customer's pain points. So understanding that domain is a very, very important thing. And oftentimes you will realize when you're doing a scientific approach to understand the domain, the people who are within the domain often don't know outside their process. But the more and when you act as like a, say, a service explains kind of person 
and try to get a holistic idea, you proactively get, okay, I can change this part. I can redesign. I, and that, of course, you use data and technology. Regulations are there. Sometimes this is uh, not something that we can do, any one of us in the data science, uh, especially with the data protection bill and all these things coming. I think it's for the right purpose, right? It may appear restrictive, but if we put ourselves in the shoes of those who are victims of stolen data, then we all will support uh, the ethics and data privacy. So, so those things are for the good, you should have it. Motivation, interdisciplinary collaboration. This is the other big thing which I have learned in my career. Uh, as I was telling 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, analytics used to be a team of statisticians, economists, Sometimes some engineer and mathematicians used to join and working out a problem in isolation with some data. That was the nature. And the insights were presented and some of them were um, delivered through integration in the call center into the technology. Others were not accepted, right? But that was how it was. In the last 10 years, I see that the the nature of the engagements where data science is applied has become more and more interdisciplinary. What is the difference between cross-functional and interdisciplinary? Can anyone answer? Cross-functional, I'm not using the word cross-functional, I'm using the word interdisciplinary. They sound similar and you may object that no, what you're telling Shayan is the same. But still, there is a slight difference. What is what is interdisciplinary? Interdisciplinary is where you look at the solution as a co-creation. Maybe I handle the data churning part of it. Maybe some other department who is much closer to the process handles the structural designing of it because they know the solution, they know the process. They know some practical impediments. I can qualify their thinking as a data scientist, but it is not that I'm just getting feedback and feeding everyone working across functions. It's you come together, radially you converge. If, you're, if you draw a circle that this is the ideation box, then all inward arrows will come from the operations, sales, data science, technology, service excellence, audit, finance, legal, HR, all of them contribute there their bit based on their understanding. And that's the best way you get the best project done because you have considered all the benefits of data science and technology. At the same time, you have accommodated the practical obstructions, challenges, motivations, objectives of the business practitioners. So this is very important and often data science teams, we view ourselves as aloof from the rest of the organization because Technically, we are enablers. We are not core of any organization. We are always enablers, unless it's a digital first company where the product is defined by what I produce. So a civil score, an experience score, unless data scientist gives the score output. Nothing is there to be sold, right? But my since my sharing is with respect to the incumbents, how do we do it? A fertilizer plant a small industry plant, textile firm. Therefore, this approach becomes very, very important. Uh, validation, encouragement to test and learn. Again, this is not much in, in the control of the data science team, but the organizations, uh, I've seen the type of managements who, who do not, who, where there is no fear of failure, but there is a fear of not trying for alternate approaches, those organizations really reap the dividends. Others look at it and they want to have it. But there's no shortcut to being a Sachin Tendulkar. One has to keep on trying. So this approach, and I've come across quite a few leaders in the industry with working with whom there is uh, no fear of failure, but there's a fear of not trying hard. So they will tell you, keep on trying, that's okay. You'll fail on, out of 10 attempts, maybe you'll fail on eight or nine of them, like Thomas Alva Edison, right? Do you remember his saying? I have not failed, I have found 
9,999 ways that it won't work. I don't know. I have never worked with this Googles and Ubers and Facebooks type. But I don't know, don't know for every successful product with use of theirs, how many parallel projects they were sponsoring financing, how many of them did not yield the result. That, that does it mean they're fail, failures? No. Because the spirit was them, one of them succeeded, right? So that encouragement should be there. Uh, again, how can analytics team lead the transformation? Uh, ensure strategic clarity build a robust data discipline, adopt the big data technology stack, develop a balanced skill mix, identify the most relevant problems and prepare the test and learn dashboard or platform. So as a data scientist, if I join a new place, this will be a kind of reference cheat sheet I abide by. What is the strategic objective, do I have sufficient clarity? What am I going to do? Who is going to use my solution? How am I going to measure the, whether I'm successful or not? This clarity, otherwise you walk a lot and then the other guy says, hey, <laughs> what have we done? Oh, good, you're an intelligent guy, smart, so yeah. And you, net net, your result is not creating any value for the firm, okay? So you start with, a robust data discipline. The three layers I can think of is harmonization, where you get all the data together and get a single source of truth. Next is the democratization. Remove the dependency on yourself. Let your solution be such that others can use it even without you being present. If this phone, this is a OnePlus phone, if OnePlus handed me over a few source, source codes and a plastic case, I wouldn't have been used to using it, right? but they packaged it in a way that I don't need their engineers to be constantly with me. So one of the ways is you package them into data products and release them for use by the business process. And finally, the visualization, a presentation layer. We spoke of the technology stack, right? So I'm not going here again. Uh, broad basing of talent pool, the interdisciplinary nature of the work that we are doing. Very important, identifying the relevant problems. There are. <coughs> 1001 Arabian night tells, right? And I believe there are 1 million one problems to solve. But which of them should be prioritized? You can't have a core data science team in the organization. Maybe 10, 20, 40, right? Maybe 100. So where do you focus? Align with the business care. What benefit it is going to give to the business? Check the feasibility with data, technology, establish the success criteria, and the time. So I've put it as smart goals, specific, measurable, then actionable, then uh, realistic and time bound. And finally, what I said is the promoting the test and learn culture. So this is all yours. So summarizing this, you have the data part, the analysis part, the delivery part, data where you ingest, how many types of data you need, what are the sources you can create from data, what are the different technology that can help you, right? How do you analyze the data and how do you deliver? So that's how a data scientist can drive the transformation in the business. I wanted to keep this uh, non-technical because the nature of the topic is to more help. How many months is this batch into this program? Two months. So as you learn the course, it is very important to understand thoroughly the different uh, chapters and different things that you'll be learning over here. But it is also very important to stay connected because in the end, your target is to go back to the industry, right? And add value for the firm. So it's good to think on these dimensions a little bit, right? and um, keep learning on whatever you get there, right? Do not constrain yourself into, I'll just learn classification or regression. Check the assumptions, like why linear regression? Oftentimes the, the solutions don't work because the feasibility condition is not properly 
evaluated. So that's my part of it. Anything I can take on as questions from the team, I'll be happy. Please go ahead. Uh, let me give you a mi micro. Yes. So usually in pharmaceuticals uh, and such healthcare industries, they provide the data to CROs, contract research organizations. And tho uh, those CROs have data scientists that work on these projects. So how is that connected to the, in the parent industry, the parent company? How will that- What is CRO? A contract research organization. Okay. Okay, so you are saying that if I, and I have not been in the pharmaceutical, but if I understand your question, uh, generalizing this question, it is something like this. If an industry runs in an engagement paradigm where the analytics is outsourced and only the insights are consumed, right? How do I apply these principles? So, good question. Now, you are from pharmaceutical industry or where? Okay, so good question. So first of all, typically the data scientists who are from a pharmaceutical domain, of course a data scientist can work cross domain because our skill set is very, very neutral to the discipline. Only thing is we have to learn the domain and the process which I understood. Speak with the people, discover more and read articles. But having said that, the data scientist will be more likely recruited by the CRO in that case, rather than the pharmaceutical industry employing them in large numbers. Having said that, I, I think the pharmaceutical industry, large firms like Novartis, I know for sure, they have a huge uh, innovation center in Hyderabad and um, and by definition a pharmaceutical firm will have their own R&D and they employ scientists right and the time of investing millions of dollars is up to eight years ten years something like that to fi find the right molecule and to test it clinical trials right is huge so typically such firms the second model which these people can do is these firms can do is they create isolated cells within the organization isolated chambers within the organization and those business units are managed as r d units they are not tasked with day-to-day -day business deliverables right so therefore, once you are a member of one such innovation lab within a large brand, then also you start with these questions, okay? So they are the strategic vision or strategic clarity may not be, what will this pharmaceutical firm gain if I do this solution? Rather, you ask like, what is that you need? What is the success criteria, the benchmark, right? How do you plan to use the solution if I can develop one? Those are the questions rather than strategically how it will impact the pharmaceutical company's shareholders that they will not be open to discussing with the CRO or this R&D units. But you can always ask, define a benchmark of success, right? Sometimes we find a difficulty in defining this benchmark of success because we may be trying this for the first time. So for departments, sales, operations, and many other departments which do the same job every day, the same type of job, not the same job, the same type of job every day, drawing a benchmark is a lot easier. I mean, but when you're trying for the, how could Columbus tell what is the turnaround time of his reaching America? He could not, right? So that's where the senior management drive comes into promoting the 
blue sky thinking, a blue ocean strategy, blue ocean thinking like that, okay, I'll just keep on investing in promoting ideas, right? How does management check is like, how well are the data scientists connected in the industry? What do we know? And generally, if you speak with the people, you get to know whether these people are really uh, thinking of something. They may not have the result, but they have an approach, they have an idea, or are they just sitting idly and wasting your funds? So therefore, R&D units should more focus on asking that question. How do you plan to use what you're asking me to develop? Any bench benchmark criteria, or will you run it for three months or six months or one year to understand what is uh, benchmark criteria? Sometimes the business may not have what is the right benchmark criteria to call it your development or your solution of success or failure. So then best is Citrus Paribus, other things in the firm remaining constant, customer interaction, sales, operations, backend processing, everything remaining constant. If you just use that thing, how is it settling? Uh, the test and learn is other thing what I said. Sometimes you may say, okay, in a randomly created sub-segment, I will not use these insights. And let me see how that measure which you want to improve stays the next one year, 12 months, or six months, or three months. Sometimes it may be two years. It depends on the experiment context. And then you randomly partition the other part of your customers, and there you apply the strategy, and then you see. Now end of the year or end of that period, six months or two months or one year or two years, you compare the two readings and then you have the answer, which is the, what is the benefit and which one is working. Okay, now one thing I must add here, I see we are nowadays uh, more busy in copying codes and running certain algorithms, right? The danger of doing that is when your code executes in a classroom uh, assignment, you feel happy, okay. But back in the in industry, uh, it's good as long as your code is running, but market conditions will keep on changing. So that time, it will be inevitable sometimes the code will not be running. So I'll give you with respect to pharmaceutical industry. Let me let me tell, not pharmaceutical, let's say, let me take a pharmaceutical, say you are, developing molecules for a part part of, uh, for a type of bacteria. And over time, the bacteria becomes resistant to that drug. It's a common knowledge, biology, right? That time answer cannot be Python has this command and therefore I got this result. You have to know why the things are the way they are, not just how the things think they are. The mosquito doesn't care how Python <laughs> or <laughs> JavaScript runs. It is developing its own intelligence, and through natural selection, the virulent strain is surviving. So that is the other thing we can keep in mind. Did I answer your question? Yeah, almost. Uh, almost, another? what is the part I didn't understand, I didn't answer? So this was in case if uh, we go in the R&D part, right? If so R&D part, this is what you have to do. You have to understand yeah. who is going to use the solution, how are they going to use it, what is the success criteria, how is it going to be measured, so right? Uh, yeah. In the outsourced company, if I get hired yeah. in that uh, the outsourced company, then what kind of a solution that I can provide them? Okay. With, right? or what kind of? I myself have not been that much part of outsourced delivery firms, but I work with the outsourced companies a lot. So, but a little part of my career, maybe how many years? One or two years, I may have been part of that kind of firms. Not even two years. So in these outsourced firms, oftentimes you do what your client asks. So first in the terms of reference or the scope of agreement, you sign up, what is the objective, what is the timeline? What if you are already told something you're developing and suddenly midway the request changes, there should be some penalty to the client in terms of, okay, we'll keep on working on it, but our project timeline means stretch and you have to pay us at so much dollars or rupees per hour, right? Then when you, when the their pocket pinches, they will also be much more alert in being articulate and, and clear in their communications with you what they want, right? 
in the rare cases it may be they don't have anything in mind they just want you for exploratory work right they are also in micro steps asking these questions is what do you want right how will you test it what in your expectation will be a good solution if i provide what are the features say you're developing a model it can be the degree of separation between the goods and bads something like that okay or it may be uh, some convergence criteria your solution has to arrive so there are some validation benchmarks which he has to tell you and if he's not to tell you if he doesn't know then he has to be open to the fact that do a test on test and learn on some you apply your solution on some you don't apply and then you compare and then you see so there is no other way there any other question yes the mic please so my question to you mr sain is that uh, data scientists they work with a lot of department like yes. hr department marketing department uh, and other department so there is this one department which is uh, the csr department of every organization so i want to know the indulgence of data scientists of any organization with that department and if like organizations are really interested in managing their csr or it is just because of the rule of law and the you know company responsibility that you have to be do csr data science in csr that's an interesting dimension you're giving me yesterday i heard someone is trying to put up something around data analytics and ethics i like that concept there uh, csr you have to see first of all what part there there are two ways you can use data one is the measurement aspect the other is the designing aspect right uh, csr so once you know the measurement aspect the csr team also has to be at a minimum literate with what analytics can do it is not a black box when my all other methods have failed i'll say cool jazz him sim and data science will give you some solution they also have to be a little bit uh, knowledgeable and uh, aware of what are the frontiers the data can cover so if the activities of csr team are measurable maybe through periodic surveys and surveys are designed statistically right and uh, then the data collection and measurement is happening right and then the insights of the csr actions can be evaluated whether they are yielding some positive difference or not right that way often times what happens is and this is not only with csr but most departments we tend to think oh since we all understand numbers it's very easy or maybe there may be some minds are going oh how dare you know more than i do right so it's like have you interacted with a doctor who who forwards with you with a to a nutritionist or dietitian a doctor can say that i know the body much better than a dietitian or nutritionist no otherwise why does the doctor still forward the patient to a dietitian or nutritionist because there is a specific role of every discipline every body of knowledge right and the doctors being educated people i mean by default if one is a doctor one has to study a lot get educated <laughs> about many things right so they understand the value of a particular discipline so these business departments also should stop uh thinking if they are like oh i don't use you i can produce on my own which they can but then they have to themselves learn a little bit of say analysis variance covariance multivariate a little bit of that and then they can do it so if it's measurable then you can apply data science in cs sir but cs is very wide topic so it depends on the exact context maybe survey is one way you can collect data right also we have a lot of government data so i like i'm not talking about you use a, a typical data science in csr but then it, some of it may be because if we talk about data science and we talk about anyone talking about data science the idea is very much you know capitalist 
that you have to you know work for the capitalist you have to just work for the profit of the industry you have to work for you know better product and everything but i i feel the the usage of data science particularly in india is uh, you know very neglected if we talk about the social good of data science so uh, my uh, like i'm keen to know if organization are really interested or have a thought of using this technology for the csr like they might not be using yet but then if they are interested in using this technology for allocating their csr because the general problems are healthcare education and then female education so these are not something you you need a proper uh, data science team for or a lot of data for but then but then you can just allocate okay if if you are allocating in maybe orissa or maybe bihar so what what is the major problem there so first of all this question is slightly different type this is not the problem of the data science or the data scientists this is a problem of the people who are in those social sectors okay. they have to reach out to the data science and are they open to to taking a more scientific approach nobody is asking them or nobody is allocating the 100% of the data scientists for the corporate sector is just the corporate sector themselves have better discovered how i can leverage them so if there is any problem it lies with the people who are employed in that sector rather than the data scientists they have to be scientifically like i will give you the example of uh, i don't know i'm sure mm, you've heard of abhijit banerjee and esther duflo and along with another gentleman who won the nobel prize in economics this year right so abhijit banerjee is an in, in, is an american indian american so presidency college kolkata then jnu and then he's in us and he's teaching there for years and his wife is french converted to american i think is that duflo so she was his student once upon a time and they were two married and this couple they have been doing extensive uh, research around poverty and they are visiting villages in birbhum in west bengal and collecting data right so and i think some place in gujarat these are the two places they have chosen for their field study sr duflo and uh, abhijit banerjee see this is the class of data scientists an indian won the nobel prize or a indian origin and we haven't even heard his name so awareness is the first step for all of us collectively what is happening around us okay have you heard of nobel prize anyone who has not heard of nobel prize okay so esther duflo abhijit banerjee their work is on randomized control trials right how they collect the data to measure the impact of poverty eradication program and apply the statistical approaches so i think nobel committee is trying to send a direction to the economists use more and more data based approaches and get out of theory maybe something like this i am too a naive person to comment in such high fi domain so nobody is preventing uh, the social sectors to do these things why blame the corporates they found it out how they can use it for themselves they are using it if the social sector is staffed by intelligent people then they will also be discovering a way how they can engage the data science discipline right and and i shared this example of abhijit banerjee and esther duflo that a nobel prize has been awarded nobel prize based on uh, applying statistical methods to measure the impact of poverty eradication programs so it can be done there it depends on the initiative anything you had a question at the end yes please so my question is in insurance uh, are data scientists integral part of product design team or they just provide insights in insurance insurance yeah and also one thing that uh, what are other assignments they have uh, in that particular domain so both they provide insights they design products they design customer service programs everything from the way a customer is identified 
to understanding what is the best product for the customer, to selecting the good risk, right? People will be genuine customers, not, not frauds, right? To understanding what are the other needs of the customer which the company can provide, cross-selling, to helping with payouts when it either comes up for maturity or the surrender, or when someone unfortunately dies and the nominee has to be paid. Evaluate whether it's a fraudulent claim or a genuine claim. So the entire spectrum of the customer's life cycle is acted upon through use of data. So, so everything they can work on. Any other question? Please. Hello. Yes. So, uh, which type of projects would you suggest to work for in the finance domain, other than uh, the stock market one? See, there is no which type, right? And there is no stereotyping that this type of project is the most, uh, or the best project to work with. Anything where data creates a positive difference and where you get to apply some of these sophisticated techniques, some of the state of the art technology qualifies as being uh, an elegant approach, what you can take, right? So it can be selecting the industry, it can be of the sector. I have seen wonderful projects being done by people from logistics industry. Uh, the nature of solutions may be quantitative or maybe uh, computer vision, maybe text analysis. Nothing I can say that the other is superior to this discipline. And that's what I try to say. It's not just classification or regression or optimization or forecasting. The business problem should be a good problem to have with, right? And uh, if you're able to articulate how the problem came, right? How you collected the data? How did you understand the data? What type of technology used and why? Which approach, maybe if you want to make your audience more um, satisfied, I considered three, four different technologies or three, four different approaches and this is the best and why? Not only the, the part where we fumble is the why part. I'm telling this repeatedly, not what part or how part. Today there are plethora of Python codes on the internet. You just copy one and run it. But the why part is very important, right? So there is no such specific area I can say that this qualifies for a good project and that doesn't. So it depends on the complexity of the project a little bit, right? That way. If, you, if the project is like, for example, I went to the field and collected data on so many individuals, right? Uh, then you design the survey, how you analyze the survey data. If the project is, I develop a computer vision by which in a crowd I can identify if, a, if an already existing customer is once again walking in, I can match him or if I can match the voice of the customer to a known voice, right? Or if I can develop an intelligent conversational logic, anything qualifies for a good data science project. It's very, it's, it's like you're asking a medical uh, science professor, what is good, the eye or the ear or the heart or the kidney? There is no answer like, okay, kidney problems are good to have and uh, eye problems are generally not that important or vice versa. I cannot answer that question, okay? Go ahead, please. I think you have a question. Sir, uh, you mentioned the regulation part in the roadblocks, the data privacy and such issues. So when the norms are very stringent in healthcare and in maybe in health insurance part also, so how do we bypass these roadblocks when the ethics and these come into play? How do we bypass? 
first of all we should not bypass no, exactly and look how do we tackle them see that's the data science and ethics the job of this there's a d difference between data science disruption and a criminal's crime data science disruption is in a positive sense a criminal also disrupts in a negative sense so there is no bypassing it right maybe if one regulation comes and we are intelligent to understand that the lawyers lawmakers they are intelligent people and they work in the collective interest the people who are debating say a non related to data science topic but say rape laws in the parliament they are doing it for the public good right so or in telangana assembly wherever i did that the lawmakers are naturally i mean very agitated i mean this cannot be allowed to happen in their domain basically so any laws are in this context they are brought for some good any tom dick and harry cannot launch a startup and get some data and just watch the data imagine your health records or someone's health records are being made public would be very much a good experience no so that's the reason this privacy is there so one is you work solutions within that constraint right the other is you try to think of other approaches of delivering the product or services which do not need that thing i'll i'll give an example for example if fintech is asking i'll just process your credit worthiness by means of getting this data on you okay and that form doesn't respect the data or something happens the form goes goes bust and and it doesn't survive no one is frauding it just doesn't turn profitable and it shuts down what happens to the data right so there are fundamental questions which have to be answered and we work within the law, legal limits or the contours within that we have to find out what is the other approach there if i can't use that data and sometimes it says that i take customer consent right one interesting conversation i had with one of my friends he is an investment banker and and i was asked like what if users are made to pay for the data or 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 or, or you ha users like google pays you for the data they use on you right because if they if you are a firm if you buy some inputs for your production from a supplier you have to pay for it what if google pays you so 10 paisa that's it or maybe a rupee then maybe things will be different and data is an asset we all agree right so so there is no breaking the law if it is not ethical we don't do it basically if there is a merit for example predicting who is a fraudster then we have to get together along with the law agencies and again law agencies are doing it for public good if it's for catching financial frauds then we have to devise these are the proper firewall system within which data can be uh, deposited it should be contributed by every player in the system whether a mutual fund whether a insurance company whether a bank whether an nlfc everyone should pull it because it's in the collective good of the financial system that i am identifying who is the fraudster right so that way anything else please go ahead i think you have to give the mic back to him uh, sir regarding this question actually i find out in internet but i couldn't find out the answer uh, there was this uh, event horizon thing happened that black hole image uh, was published so in that team sorry sorry team what is it come again what uh, image that event horizon uh, that event horizon event happened that black hole image was uh, published uh, okay so in that actually was uh, concerned that were data scientists were involved in that or all of them were astronomers because i couldn't find out on internet i think okay so first of all 
are you assuming that data scientists cannot be astronomers or astronomers cannot be data scientists? No, actually not like that because uh, the thing was data was like in petabytes of data. Huh? So astronomers uh, could manage that data or they need, they were uh, in need of data scientists at that time. See, astronomers are not astrologers. They are scientists themselves, right? Astronomers have been crunching data before you and I got access to the substrate servers. When, have you heard of this concept called digital twins? So digital twins is a technology which NASA developed. Uh, how do they fix things in the space? Suppose something goes in the space station. So they create a simulated model where they make the changes here and that transmitter signal fixes it there. Now to send a rocket in the sky is actually rocket science. So what makes us think that astronomers can't handle petabytes of data? We may not be able to handle astronomers challenge. But remember, I don't know any data science scientist who has sent a rocket in the sky. And that involves coding and programming and ISRO has got, or ISRO, NASA, whichever agency, ISRO has got like a lot of these engineers there. They may not be producing computer visions to identify a cat and a dog, but they are analyzing data, right? And they have always used the latest technology which is available to crunch the data. How do you say, think that they measured the red shifts of stars? You're aware of the red shifts of stars, right? So how do they measure the red of star if they do not know how to analyze data? So if you're assuming that data scientists are a different breed, then that's not the right way of looking at it. Astronomers themselves are data scientists, right? They're not philosophers. They observe the sky, they take re readings, and they analyze it on their own. And petabytes of data, imagine Voyager 1 sending images and signals, right? There's astronomers who do their own data science and they find out whether it's a computer vision, whether it's a radio telescope, right? So they know all the data science techniques. Data science is a very newly coined word. The techniques which we mostly think of data science, uh, if you go to the internet, the papers have been published uh, before any one of us in this room were born, in the theoretical concept papers, right? So, yes, today what has changed is the democratization. Everyone can access that system because Google is pro providing the servers. And there is some advancement in the computing power also. But supercomputers were there long before Google came into being, right? What is the largest known prime number? Supercomputers were already there. So it's not a new thing that way. The theory of neural network was I think published in 1975. How many were born before 1975? No, no one here. I don't think any one of us. I was not born and I think I'm the, possibly the eldest one in this room. So they were born, they were published before we were born. So, so there is no point for us to think that we are suddenly a new a uh, bunch of yo-yo guys like who are doing the cool stuff, wearing a jeans and sneakers and uh, drinking some fancy beverage. It's not like that. Yeah. What has changed is, yes, there has been changes coming in the technology, I should say, faster computation, definitely. Uh, Python, do you know when Python was first introduced? 1990s, right? When was Google launched? At least 10 years later. Facebook, even beyond, even after that, right? So these techniques were there. It's democratically available. That's the single most thing and very cheaply available. And rest of it, what you hear is the marketing pitch of consultants. So that's why.
how many of you were working in some sort of data before? How many of you were working in IT? Some of you were working in IT, right? So, good. No more questions? Something from this side of the room? This side of the room is very, very silent. I got plenty from one side of the room. I think you are the only one from this side who asked. Okay. So, first of all, I think uh, in in data science, it's a science after all, and science is about answering the why part. Okay. So in our endeavor to being data scientists, we often become good technicians. Now technicians are good because they make the things work for that time. But if that is the requirement, then we don't need doctors. Compounders are sufficient. No, no offense to the compounders. They have their own value in the system. But you don't need doctors. The why part is, is one of the most important part which as students of data science, we have to understand and relentlessly pursue as much as we can. And like I tell you, there is no one type of project which is a good over the others. You may solve like how a company like say DHL Express or FedEx finds the most optimal route of transportation of their aircraft and ship. That can be a problem. Or like how the police can find a computer vision to detect a criminal in a crowd. Or like how to develop a conversational engine. So nothing is like this is the better than the other, something like that, right? Something, so that's the one thing. The second thing is a lot of uh, terms will be evolving because consulting companies have their own objective to, to attract the audience right so i have read i think i think there are more write ups around what is a data science versus machine learning versus ai right our time our, our focus should be more in understanding the subjects rather than thinking what is the machine learning what is data science there in broad you have one side some computer science one side some statistics so they both were developing somewhat separately in the last, say, till, till the Second World War, I will say. And around that time, some people like Alan Turing and others, they came and they set the foundations how these two disciplines are gradually merging. They developed the computer science and how they can be merged. So that's the way the things are merging together, okay? Otherwise, uh, all these jargons, terms, they are fine, but as a practitioner myself in the field for 20 years, this is all it is about. So, yes. A hey, mic. Hi, sir. My name is Amit. So, uh, suppose you are going to recruit a couple of candidates uh, for your in banking or insurance, uh, what are the particular skill sets that you might be looking at in hiring a candidate? Good question. So, a very relevant question for this audience. Different people have different uh, ways of assessing the people. And the way I try to get people is, the simplest question is, if I imagine this person walking along with me, do I feel comfortable or not? That's the simplest question. And it has got no mathematical justification. But there are certain parameters on which I tend to evaluate the person. Now I'm using the word I here because different people have different way of selecting the people, right? And there is no right or wrong, I believe, here. So one of the things is, it starts with a curiosity. 
is is a and it shows in that tension and pressure of interview whether the person has crammed up a lot of fancy techniques and appearing or the person is generally a curious minded person it just shows and that's because i have taken so many interviews in my life and it's very easy for me to quickly catch and and the amount of time is only a few minutes there so curiosity is is one thing i think very important right some people positively curious it's not the curiosity kill the cat kind of curious but positive curious the second thing is the problem solving ability so how this can be measured in an interview different people have different ways of assessing some people give mathematical puzzles and tricks and those kind of things to solve and uh, many big brands do the same way am i aware so what i do is i myself think what if i'm on the other side of the table then in the pressure and tension i may not be actually able to solve that puzzle doesn't mean that i don't know the trick there so where i tend to focus is how the person describes the project one has done and here i mercilessly grill the person into a series of nested whys because that shows whether this person has copied the code from somewhere else and is superficial in the application of it or can really answer any type of why the mathematical why the technological why or any type of why that may be relevant for this person to know and why the project because this is one area where this person has put dedicated time and effort to discover more around the solution so it is only fair that i assume that the person will be the strongest in that particular field so if there are 10 papers or 20 papers in the classroom and you are expected to score a minimum of say 60 or 70 percent i don't know whatever is the record benchmark you are expected to score that benchmark that's one way of looking at it but there is one topic i have selected as my project and that can be around anything to your to answer your question but whatever i took how much deep can i get now one category of students they'll be getting eliminated in the first round of why the second category they will answer one why but within the why of why they can't get and that is where you check the depth of the person's problem thinking skills and this is not unfair because this is the easiest thing for the person to respond because even under an tensed moment during job interviews if i can't defend what i have given my heart and soul for the last 3 months or 4 months then i'm really not cut out for this discipline is what i see and finally the other thing what it shows is the communication skills if you are not able to communicate what you are supposed to be very confident about now mind you i'm talking about the project work i'm not talking about the entire syllabus which has been taught just the project work so that this gives a fantastic way to to select who is a, a good communicator okay sometimes i do find people and especially this is more towards the laterals who already are working somewhere sometimes people who are like btechs we give some puzzles and sometimes to a thrill we find that they are solving all the puzzles puzzles or many of the puzzles so that's a bonus so curiosity curiosity will also be explained by the why unless you are curious you will not be able to answer a series of why of why of why right it's a mini research kind of thing that project okay so did you answer the question okay anything else no okay thank you very much i really appreciate your coming over on a sunday morning and giving the chance to interact i wish you all the best 
as you take up data science and your future studies and career. Thank you very much.